Our parents have a past. Sometimes that past catches up with them, leaving their children holding the pieces. Sometimes, though, that past reveals itself and helps their children realize more fully who they are and from where they come. One mother has chosen to expose the darkness of her life, but only after her death. Will her children be able to handle learning who the woman they know best really is? The mom with the mystery, Eleanor Bennett. Our book, Black Cake by Charmaine Wilkerson. And you're listening to Lit Society. Let's Let's get lit. lit. Ah. Hi, readers. This is Kari. And this is Alexis. And you're listening to Lit Society, a show about books and drama. How are you today, Alexis? You know, I'm doing all right. I want to... Can I tell you a quick... Yeah, please. What I did... Okay, yesterday, I went out to a restaurant, a Jamaican restaurant, because I wanted mm. to taste black cake. And it was really delicious. You just really went to cool. a restaurant and got it? <laughs> yeah. And it was great? Did you know this restaurant? It was really good. So my daughter recommended it to me. And um, she had been gone for a while. It's the cousin, I think, or a relative of a friend of hers. So I um, love that. She took me there. So I went there to have black cake. And it was really good. I don't think I've ever had it. And you and I were speaking about how we don't mm-hmm. like fruitcake. Right. But how this don't sound like that. <laughs> so yeah. what were the differences between black cake and like a fruitcake? So for the fruitcakes that I've had in the past, they had actual fruit in them where you could yeah. taste the whole pieces. So I thought this was going to have like raisins and whatnot, but it didn't. Mm. So the um, texture was more like cake. It, it, consistent. Cake. <laughs> yeah, consistent. Pound Not cake big like. chunks of fruit. Oh, pound Not cake big. with booze in it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It's a rum cake. You've yeah. had rum cake before, right? I love rum cake. That yeah, so this awesome. is rum cake without the the fruit, but okay. it is a fruit cake. Well, I'll have it's, to come where you are and taste that. You've got to. The food was oh, good. Oh, that sounds the food great. Was pretty good. And then um, there was a woman next to me, and I was really awkward, and I didn't share the podcast with her, but when I did, <laughs> it was really weird. But anyway, <laughs> we won't dwell on that. She was really nice. She's a reader, and oh. we love readers, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And sometimes we try to promote our show in person and we're like, yeah, we have a, we have a podcast. <laughs> and they're like, what? Oh, it's, just, it's nothing. You you like books? Anyway, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to talk about your show. I don't even do it no more. I know. It ain't worth it. <laughs> <sighs> That's why, listeners, we need you to proselytize Lit Society podcast <laughs> in your highways and byways. Let your people know about this show if you love it. Now let's continue. Usually we open the show with a theme of the week inspired by the book we're reading, but today we're going to do something different because I did not prepare, and I had <laughs> two weeks to do it. And to be honest, I couldn't think of a theme that I wasn't forcing into this. I, mm. I did come up with a few and I just didn't feel like uh, they respected the topic of the book well enough. So the book has a lot of themes in it that are heavier. And so uh, I did. I decided not to touch any of them. But as you're speaking, Alexis, I'm thinking what I'm going to do is post three black cake recipes on our website, oh. litsocietypod.com. And maybe you and I can try them. Well, and we'll show here's... the results on social <gasps> media. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, I love think? that. You know, I love now, a baking Alexis, situation. Uh, I like, oh, you don't? I love, yes, you know I love oh, a baking situation. I thought you say you don't have a kitchen right now because you're traveling the world, uh, you know. Also that, yeah. but I have to make do with what I have. <laughs> okay, great. So Alexis is actually a Michelin-starred uh, chef <laughs> slash baker, and I'm terrible at baking. I think anyone that can read can cook, but baking requires a science and a patience um, and just a wisdom that I don't have. Uh, so this should be fun. It's going it to be really be fun. funny. 
Maybe this should be a, a episode on YouTube. You guys know that right. every podcast we produce now is a video episode, pretty much. And we got a lot going on on YouTube. So maybe this should be like a one off. Oh, I'm excited. So then take well, a look now, you guys. Cook with us. Go to yeah. Lit Society Pod. You'll find three recipes for black cake. And um, we'll let you know when we're going to prepare that. Maybe we'll have a live show. I don't know. Ah! Ah! But listen, <laughs> listen. Um, Charmaine Wilkerson has this whole little setup on her website about black cake and it has um, a recipe um, music so I'm sure you'll come across it and it'll be great you'll see let's it. just steal her work Hurrah! let's do it all right then <laughs> well let's <laughs> Let's forsake a break this week and just hop into the context, if you don't mind. Alexis, can I you don't. tell us a little more about Charmaine? Okay, so Charmaine Wilkerson is a former news and communication professional. She graduated from Stanford University. She is from New York, but she spent child her childhood in Jamaica, and she's currently living in Italy. Yeah, I Listen. saw that. Mm-hmm. She um, has award-winning short fiction, which has appeared in various anthologies and magazines. This book, Black Cake, is her debut novel. The book was published in February of 2022, and Oprah has chosen this book for a Hulu series. So we should hear more about that soon. Do you know of a show so, produced by Oprah? Uh, well, that I've actually watched. This, I've, I'm ashamed to say this because I know she's a huge producer and I'm sure yeah, we've watched yeah. her thing. Oh, you made me watch a couple with Halle Berry. Halle Berry used to be Oprah's muse. Oh my goodness, it's all coming back to me. <laughs> yes, The Wedding and you and I watched. Oh, with Michael Easley. Oh, don't tell me. Uh, uh, Zora Neale Hurston's. If Colored Girls, no. is that one? <laughs> oh, oh, that one. Okay, I'm sorry, I, about I know y'all one, friends, but... but Tyler Perry, you are not okay. Oh, no. So <laughs> we mean <laughs> no. Their eyes were watching God. Whoever Their shouted it out at God. home, mm-hmm. thank you, listener. <laughs> so <laughs> hey, in the moment when I was little watching the movies, I thought this is trash. I thought I was a critic. Now as an adult, I'm like, mm, this is good. So I think I'm going to like Black Cake produced by Oprah with a screenplay heavily adapted from this book. Not to give the verdict away, but I'm excited about that. Have you watched okay. any of these um, books that we've done on the show, the, the movie iterations? Like Daisy Jones and the Six, which is a movie or no, TV show. No, I haven't show. seen that. Me is it out already? Yeah. I'll never see it. Um, and please stop doing your English accent on the show. Um, what else? Is it out already? Is it out? I swore. I swear I, I saw just... it. Um, what's the one you watched on the airplane? Well, what did I watch on the airplane? You told me not to watch it. Oh, yeah. Delia Owens. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not where educated, the educated, but where the crowd that scene. So I have to say... Huge fan of Reese Witherspoon's picks usually. Well, I was, I'll say it's about 50-50 for me. All the movies and shows she's made, I've never watched them. I'm just not interested. <laughs> so I can't voice an opinion. Little Fires Everywhere, I felt about that book the way I felt, so I'll never watch the series. Um, but, yeah, so this is one, one movie TV iteration I'm actually really excited to get into. Well, we'll see. We Mm -hmm. shall see. Let me just tell you briefly, the title comes from um, her having scribbled a rum soak fruit cake or black cake pencil recipe in a notebook. And that was the inspiration for the title. And then a younger relative asked her at one point um, for that recipe. And it made her think about inheritance and Mm -hmm. how we choose to keep some things closer to our hearts than others. And that helps her form out the book. So that's our author and a little bit of context. I love that. Well, um, can you give us a brief, no spoiler synopsis of the book? Yeah. Estranged siblings, Byron and Benny, 
must come together after their mother's death to listen to an audio recording from her, which makes them question whether they really knew her. Kari, who do you think would enjoy this book? Yeah, if you are a fan of um, Yajasi and that type of layered character filled novel storytelling style where every character in the book has a background that is interesting, that is thought provoking. And that leads to the book the, the, that helps the whole what the book becomes as a whole, if that makes sense. Like every character's story helps the overall story of the book. I don't know what I'm it saying. Contributes. It's early. Uh, but if you like that, yeah. if you like that. I think this may be for you. I hope that makes sense. Um, it's also based in family, um, which yeah, Jassy does really well. So that's who kept coming to mind um, when I was reading this. And Alexis, what made you pick Black Cake for our podcast? So when I saw the book, I, it made me think of an author, a contributing author to Essence magazines that I had read. And I knew that she was coming out with a book. And I was wrong. This is not that person. And it was her. It wasn't her. Oh. It's actually a different person. I got to figure out who it is. But it was not Charmaine. So that was why I selected the book. But, you know, that's it. Okay. Okay. Well, I love it. Well, Alexis, how do you feel? Are you ready to take a spoiler-filled deep dive into Black Cake by Charmaine Wilkerson? Yeah, I think I'm ready. Let's do it. The floor is yours. All right. A rich, dark combination of candy dried fruits soaked in port wine and rum and baked to perfection. There's a little prologue. And in 1965, you see a man standing on the water's edge telling himself he knew this day would come. He's waiting for his daughter's body to be washed ashore. A woman police officer is walking towards him with his daughter's wedding dress smeared in black cake and lilac icing. Let's jump to 2018. I'm sorry, what an opening. What an opening. As the scene is described and unfurled before me, I said, oh, this is a book book. <laughs> How you stuff all of this intrigue in the first two paragraphs? <laughs> I was like, oh, this made me think I hate reading books on this show because <laughs> I got a deadline and I would have totally, right. as, as soon as I read these first two paragraphs, I was like, I want to be on vacation somewhere or in a cabin somewhere just reading this. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to jump to 2018. And here we find Byron. He's meeting his sister, Benny, at the elevator door his instinct is to hug his sister, but instead he pushes her away and they head to the attorney's office. Their greeting is not friendly. He hasn't seen his sister in eight years. And when their father died, he thought he would see his sister and they reconnect like at the funeral. He actually thought he saw her, but she didn't show. Byron says he thought he saw her in the shadows. Yeah. Byron says Benny turned their family's relationship into a cold war. So now we're in the attorney's office. The attorney has an envelope and it's labeled B and B. And that's the mother's um, kind of nickname for them. Whenever they're together, she refers to them as B and B. So that's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> It's a handwritten note from their mother, Eleanor Bennett, and a USB drive, which has an audio recording eight hours long. And Mrs. Bennett, their mother, wants them to listen to this recording together with the attorney. In the note, she tells them there's a small black cake in her, in her freezer. And she wants them to share it when the time is right. Their parents used to share a slice of black cake for their anniversary. And his mom would make a new layer every five years. 
and keep it in the freezer. She hadn't made one since their father died five years ago. The attorney, Mr. Mitch, takes the memory stick and plays the audio. And you know what? I remember in this part that as they hear their mother's voice, they lean in eager to hear what she has for them. What yeah. is she what is she saved for this moment that she couldn't just tell them, you know, while she was alive? Ooh. Exactly. Even yeah. saying it, I'm excited. Mm. Right. So their mother tells them that she doesn't think she will see them again together and that they're both good but very stubborn children. <laughs> she tells them to do their best to get along and Benny Stands up and decides, listen, I don't need to listen to this recording now. But Mr. Yeah, I was Mitch like, Benny, tells her, sit down. We want to listen to it. <laughs> Me too. I was like, girl, sit down. Be quiet. You got enough. <laughs> it just started. She irritated me early in the book, okay? I'm going to say me that. Too. I said, oh, you spoiled. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so Mr. Mitch reminds her, this is a requirement from your mother. You need to listen to it together. And he tells them they could listen to it at your mama house, but you need to listen to it together and with me. I need to stay and hear this. (laughs) So whatever is more convenient, okay? So they agree to listen to it later. Um, And as they gather for the listening later, um, their mother reveals in the recording that B&B need to know about their family how their parents really met, about where their parents are really from, and about their sister. (gasps) Their sister? (laughs) Righto. I mean, every page of this book pulls me deeper and deeper. Wow. They got a sister. They got a sister. So, of course, they're shocked. They got plenty of questions. But Mr. Mitch, the attorney, he insists they need to listen to the recording all the way through. They're surprised that they wouldn't even know this about their mother. They knew their parents had been married forever, that they were both from the Caribbean, both orphaned, both immigrated to Britain before moving to the United States together. They know. Their story is a love at first sight story. Like mom fainted when she first saw their dad. So That's what the dad said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she fainted when she first saw me. Exactly. <laughs> so dads. <laughs> okay. So mom begins this story with a young girl named Covey. Covey's mother, Matilda, and her friend Pearl, the who was also the family helper, they had a small but popular cake business. Their most popular cake is the black cake. It's, a, as I mentioned, a rum-soaked fruit cake. Pearl's black cake was the best cake in town, and Matilda's icing flowers were second to none. To have black cake willed into the halls of a reception prepared by Pearl and Matilda would have been talked about for years to come. Black cake meant sisterhood and a kitchen full of laughter. But Matilda, Covey's mom, disappeared one day, never to return. Covey was 12 years old. Her mother taught her to swim and appreciate the sea. And when her mother left, her father told her to stay out of the sea. It was dangerous. Covey's father is Lin. He's the child of a Chinese immigrant. And Lin is also a gambler, a compulsive gambler, whose longtime winning streak was ending. And it resulted in the loss of Covey's mother and some other things. Her father wanted to sell all his things and return to China, but he knew he couldn't return to China with his brown-skinned daughter. His brother told him also that there's no island to return to. You belong the bay, here now. Yeah. <clears throat> the bay was Covey and her best friend Bunny's hangout spot. Okay? They were both great swimmers. Covey was faster, but Bunny could swim the distance. They loved to swim, and the water in the bay 
just was challenging. It's a challenge that um, Covey embraced fully. They were often, though, warned to stay away and have more respect for the sea, especially since they were older now. Covey wanted her and Bunny, though, to try and raise money and be sponsored for this big harbor race. And this big harbor race brings like the best swimmers. But this the area that they were coming from, again, I mentioned is kind of got these tough waters and they would have the upper hand because they could practice in these waters. So Covey felt strongly that they could win this race. Mm-hmm. Bunny, however, didn't like to race. Um, she knew that was Covey's, Covey's strength, but it, she didn't feel like it was hers. But it, Covey encouraged Bunny to go ahead. And Bonnie was going to uh, do There were sharks Covey in the water. Did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and there's sharks in this water. And um, there's all kind of stories about why you should be afraid of sharks <laughs> in the water. So it's all kind of do stuff. Do we need stories? Anyway. We know. <laughs> Hello. They okay. eat you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Listen. <laughs> Covey saw this race, though, as a ticket to get off the island. So Covey and Bunny, they practiced through jellyfish things and fears of, of sharks. Let's meet Gibbs. So a new boy is in town. <clears throat> His name is Gibbs, and he joins the swim club. So he's now with um, hanging out with... Covey and Bunny all the time. But he's also a surfer. And he teaches Covey to surf. And she picks it up like a natural. They become fast friends (laughs) and start spending time together (laughs) and telling each other about their dreams for the future. And then the more they talk, though, Gibbs would eventually start saying, like, we our future. <laughs> you know what I mean? Anyway, so Covey knew she wanted to go to England for university so that she could do something with numbers and she was good at it like her father. Gibbs also wanted to go to England. He wanted to study law so he could help people who have been taken advantage of. Gibbs felt that he had to leave the island if he was to have success in his future. Covey and Gibbs spends lots of time together because they were in a lot of the same clubs. Yeah, they in but love. they also stole some <laughs> alone time, <laughs> and her father picked that up. She he knew <laughs> that she was spending time with some boy. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> listen, Covey's father suspected she was seeing a boy, right? Of course, Covey going to deny it because the kids is in love. <laughs> and then one day, now I don't really get this part, but her father grabbed her hair and then he knew that she'd been swimming in the sea. Yeah, because the, the like, smell of the Stay hair, out of that the dampness. Sea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, fine. And it so was he dangerous. Told her not to go it truly really was again. dangerous and he thought she was being brazen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which she was. And so, (laughs) yeah, because her mother really taught her not to fear anything, right? Mm -hmm. When it came to the sea. Um, The irony. He told her, don't go back out there again, okay? Um, She was like, you can't stop me. (laughs) Shoot. He was like, I'm going to give you a whooping because you disrespectful. Okay. (laughs) Anyway, that's what happened. Listen, it's September 1963. Hurricane Flora was coming. And back then, you didn't know a storm was coming until it was right up on you. And then um, it was the season for storms. So, of course, they expect them. But this storm came. So on October 5th, 1963, three teenagers are swimming in the bay and two others are following them in a small boat. The boat had already capsized and no one was going to admit that they were afraid. They was just trying to get back to shore at this point. Mm-hmm. The, um, as the storm was approaching, Bunny's father actually reached out to Covey's father, Lynn, 
and ask him, hey, listen, meet me in the center because I'm going to get bunny from you. You know, the storm is getting rough. Let's do this. He was like, bunny, she ain't here. I thought she was with you. So she done lied and said she at Covey house. Basically, they both at the water. They in the water, y'all. With the boys. With Mm -hmm. the with the boys. Okay. Mm -hmm. So anyway, they they fathers come to the area where they think they are and they find them struggling to get ashore. But what Lynn sees is that his daughter is strong and she in love with some boy. (laughs) Right. So when he approaches them um, Lynn scolds Covey and told Gibbs, as the oldest, you should have known better. Um, but Covey steps up and is like, it's my idea. I made everybody do this. And Gibbs is like, listen, Mr. Lynn Cook, I take full responsibility. And Lynn knew then that his daughter was in love. But he forbade them to see each other. And yeah, he's like a boy like that could really uh, steal a girl's heart because he's taking responsibility. Mm-hmm. He's speaking up like a man. He's taking, um, you know, the blame for everyone. And that makes Lynn even more terrified. Like, yeah. what a boy like that could, you know, take my daughter away. But they all made it to shore. And yeah, yeah, gives gives takes full responsibility. Yeah, I like the way you recited that. Anyway, <laughs> spring 1965, Covey's father um, mentions uh, Clarence Henry, a.k.a. Little Man. Now, <laughs> Little Man is the island bully, a ruthless money lender, um, and crossing him a could murderer. have deadly consequences. Mm-hmm. But Covey's father was like, oh, he coming to our house. He want to date you. She like, well, huh? Covey is shocked, of course, because she was like, why would I be expected to entertain such a man? And plus, he old as you, daddy. So this is not the kind of man that you want around your daughters because you've heard stories about him. And her father. Yeah, he's a rapist. Sorry. (laughs) Also that. And her yeah, father. And if you spurn his advances, he might kill you. Yeah. And the daddy got him coming to the house. This is dark. Very. And her father reveals that he's done some business with Clarence and he expressed mm-hmm. interest in Covey. So Lynn pleaded with his daughter, but Covey knew by that look on her father's face that it had to do with his gambling debts. One day, little man is like, oh, excuse me. The reputable Clarence Henry walked to Mr. Lynn's home while Covey was home alone. He had been making regular visits for courting, but this was a different day. And when Covey told him, hey, my dad is not here, so bye, don't come. He was like, no, I'm coming anyway. And so he tries to kiss her, push up on her, and and she turns away And then when he tries again, she avoids him. When he tries again, she avoids avoids him. And he grabs her and asks her if she is this modest when she down at the beach with old Mr. Gibbs. Mm -hmm, Her little boyfriend. Mr. Gibbs. He says the boy's name in a way that is like spit coming out of his mouth. And it scares her. Because she realizes this powerful man could, you know, take my family and kill my boyfriend. Mm-hmm. And so and my father has me is basically selling me to him. Yeah. Oh. And Covey didn't think anyone knew about her and Gibbs. But people did say that yeah. little man and his brother they had people everywhere in the cove and mm-hmm. villages of the parish who owed them something and they were willing to do what they needed to do to, you know, make things right with little man. Of course, this scared her for herself, like Kari said, for Gibbs and her family. And when he let her go, he asked her if Gibbs was going to help her father out of his gambling debt. And he told told her that 
he owned her father's shops now. Her father couldn't keep a wife or his shop, shops, plural, because of his gambling. And if you don't want your father to lose this house, then you needed to get some act right. So the next Mm -hmm. evening, her father told her that little man wanted to marry her. And Covey was speechless. So like a few days later, once it gets around the community, Gibbs charges up Covey about little man. She's like, you get me like you get ready to marry him. Like it's her choice. <laughs> yeah. And she's He's like broken hearted, like we dating. How you going to marry little man? Exactly. How could you do this to me? Exactly. And then <laughs> Covey explains that, no, no, this is my father's mess. And she just knew that she wouldn't have to marry him because it didn't make sense. Yeah, Daddy's going to. Daddy's gonna, his eyes are gonna open wide one day. He'll realize that this is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Don't worry. But they never did. And Mm-mm. Gibbs is like, listen, leave now with me. I'm going to school in two weeks and we could just go. But Covey is like, no, I'm not ready yet. I'm, I need to make my own plans and go. I can't go with you. But now they're in full wedding planning mode because she ain't go with with Gibbs, she got to, you know, get married. So she picked the ugliest and most expensive dress she could find. And as she she tries on a dress, she's wondering, listen, could I hide a knife in here? Um, mm-hmm. And one of the folds of the dress? Hmm. <laughs> what am I willing to do? Mm-hmm. But she also continues to hope that her father would do something to stop this wedding. And she wasn't talking to him until he did. And then when she found out her mom's friend, the family friend who did the cakes, was making the wedding well, cake, she was she's furious. She's like the, ho- the housekeeper. But also her mom's friend. Because they got the cake business together. And before you could blink an eye, Covey was married to Little Man. Uh, listen. Pearl, her mom's friend, housekeeper, and cake partner, knew why Covey's mother left. I'll just throw this little piece in there. But she never understood why she didn't return for her daughter. And Covey's mother promised to send for Covey, and she even left money with Pearl to make arrangements. But it's actually been six years. And Pearl hadn't heard from Covey's mother in four years. So Pearl never told Covey. And she hated to think that something serious happened to her mom. But she also didn't want to think that her mom changed her mind. And Pearl and Covey were really close. So she's like, She's like the mother figure for her these days. So the fact that Covey's mad at her because she's making this cake and, you know, she's going through a lot right now. So it's not a good situation. But Pearl is genuinely concerned. Like, how can I get my baby girl out of this situation? So Pearl thought about how she could help. And she wondered if she could possibly poison the cake so that it affected little man, but not Covey and the rest of the guests. You laugh. Why, Kari? <laughs> Do you know something? Because everybody trying to kill little man. Um, Covey's like, can, can I fit a knife in my dress? The housekeeper's like, can I poison just part of the cake? Even the best friend is like, what can I do to get in on the killer? Everybody. Everybody is ready to just kill. And meanwhile, the dad just getting drunk. And he's the cause of it. And he's the cause of all this. And then, and so it's not just those people. It's not like anybody would miss him if he died. But of course, Oh, everyone hates him. But everyone's also scared of him. And he's got a family. Yeah. We'll have to be held accountable. Because they think even the police are involved in his businesses and whatnot. And they are. Mm -hmm. And Pearl also didn't want to go to jail. So while she thinking about all that, she was like, I I mean, I could do that, but you know, they'd be looking right at me and I ain't going to jail and stuff. 
So Pearl decided she was going to decorate this cake in a way that would spell out a code for for Covey to understand. Covey to understand. The top tier of the cake, that section would go home with a couple, okay? And it had lilac color flowers. And Covey didn't like the color lilac. And she would get the message and smile. And Pearl had a little bottle of poison and she wanted to use it. She was still trying to work through how she was going to use it. Um, <laughs> rat poison, yeah. Yeah. She was trying to figure out how to use it without getting caught. Because as I mentioned, she ain't trying to go to jail. So the day of the wedding, as I said, they got married. It's the reception. The cake is being wheeled out. And Covey sees the lilac colored flowers. And she responds just as Pearl expected her. And, to and she you know she gets the message i thought it was just that even though i'm doing this i know you hate it is that is that the message kari yeah the message isn't um have your husband eat this so he can die <laughs> okay. the message is i'm not a bore i'm not a, i'm on your yeah. team still i'm still on your team we all have to do what little man says yeah. or he'll kill all of us but just know i love you yeah. i'm still here for so, you so and she did all that with just yeah. the purple flower. And at four that afternoon, after the cake was wheeled out, Clarence Henry, a.k.a. Little Man, stood up from his chair as he and his bride finished up their plates of rum cake, stumbled backward over his chair and dropped dead. At his wedding, he didn't get to... <laughs> did he... I didn't know he got to taste the cake. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know he got to taste the cake. Yeah, he died Listen, at his own wedding. Pearl ran to Covey, but Covey was already gone. On the morning of the wedding, Pearl topped the cake with a cluster of icing flowers, delicate periwinkles that would dazzle the guests and which would spell out a code that only Covey could decipher. Pearl had adjusted the coloring to give the flowers a lilac tone. The top tier of the cake laden with the flowers was the section that would go home with the bride and groom. Despite her distress, Covey would smile when she saw them. Pearl was sure of it. Covey had never liked lilac, just like her mother before her. Covey would understand what Pearl was trying to say. Pearl reached into her apron pocket for the small bottle that she'd been carrying around for three days and put it on the counter. She began to spoon more icing from a mixing bowl into the piping bag. Just then, she heard a pss and turned to find Bunny looking in from the kitchen doorway. Pearl pushed the bottle behind the bowl and waved at Bunny to come in. Well, look at you, Pearl said. Bunny spun around to show the pale swirl of the dress that she put on for Covey's wedding. She tipped her feet from side to side. Her shoes had been dyed to match. Then Bunny's smile disappeared. She walked over to Pearl, leaning against the kitchen counter and hung her head. I know, Bunny, I know, Pearl said. She jutted her chin out toward the cake. But look, it's lovely, Pearl, Bunny said, sounding on the verge of tears. Then she twisted up her face. But the flowers, they're lilac colored. Yes, they are, Pearl said, nodding proudly. But Covey hates that color. Yes, she does, Pearl said. She put her hand on her hips and waited for Bunny to make the connection. Finally, Bunny smiled and nodded slowly. She straightened up and reached into the mixing bowl, swiping a bit of icing from the side with her finger. Bunny looked at the icing, then reached toward the bowl again. No, go on now, Pearl said. I still have to finish up. I'll see you out there. All right, later, Bunny said, wiping her hand on a dish rag. Walk good, Pearl said, as she crouched down and reached under the counter for more confectioner's sugar. When she stood up again, Bunny was already crossing the next room. On the afternoon of the wedding, the black cake was wheeled into the reception hall under a veil of white lace. There was the traditional moment of silence as four attendants lifted the veil. The guests cheered and applauded Pearl's latest creation, but Covey just stood there, staring at the cake, her face blank. It was as if the girl wasn't even in the room. It took her a few moments before her face began to change. First, she looked confused, just as Bunny had. 
She looked up at Pearl and back at the cake, and then her face softened. Finally, Covey understood what she was looking at. It was small consolation, but it was something. No one was more shocked than Pearl by the suddenness of which transpired soon after. At about four o'clock that afternoon, Clarence, little man Henry, aged 38, ruthless moneylender and occasional murderer, stood up from the table where he and his new bride, Coventina Dauphine Leancock, nearly 18, had been finishing their plates of rum cake, stumbled backwards over his chair and dropped dead on the white tile floor. Pearl hurried across the room trying to get to Covey, but when she reached the other side, Covey was gone. Listen, let's flash back to the prologue. When I mentioned the man standing on the water's edge, Mm -hmm. Lynn Cook, Covey's daddy. This is where we find him. This is where we find him. We caught up now to the beginning of the book. Mm Mm-hmm. He's like, man, I can't keep a woman. I can't keep a life. And now my daughter is an, in the sea. In the sea. Under the sea. Oop. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> He's devastated, okay? He's devastated. He put his daughter in his position. And he wants his daughter to come back. Is he? Oh, good point. He is. Tangent. Do you feel at this point that Lynn has any type of remorse for basically selling his daughter to the gangster island, to the island gangster? I think he does. Mm, interesting. I, I do. He is. He's I think he's sad that she's probably dead. Ooh. <laughs> and it's his fault that she probably drowned. Yikes. But I don't think he yet feels remorse for his action. Interesting. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. So the police end up calling <laughs> off the search because it's late. Another storm is coming. They don't want to do it. <laughs> they don't wanna, yeah, they looked in the sea. They was like, yeah, she did. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> any cake left? <laughs> <laughs> so Mr. Uh, Lynn Cook wanted them to keep searching. As I mentioned, the storm was coming, but he felt like um, not even Covey could survive these waters. And he knew she was a strong swimmer. But Bunny, her bestie, thought of her time with Covey. And she realized that Covey couldn't be dead. <laughs> so she went to Pearl and told her. She like, Pearl... Covey wouldn't even try to swim in these waters with the storm brewing. She has too much respect for the water. But instead, she would hide out until it calmed down. And I think I know her hiding place. So Pearl quickly grabs up some items, some money for Covey and pulls out the um, a box Covey's mom had given her. And she writes a note and she gives her name of somebody she could contact and she gave Bunny instructions to pass it on. And she says to Bunny, you go, you'll see her, but you leave this box and you won't be sticking around with her because she needs to be on the run. Yeah. And if you stick around, that'll lead people to her Mm -hmm. because you don't know if you're being followed. So whatever you do, make sure it's quick. Yeah. Yeah. So Bunny found Covey. She's alive. And just where she thought she was. Yeah. Covey didn't die. Covey didn't die. Little man's still dead, though. He good and dead. Mm-hmm. Covey knew that um, she would have to leave everything and everyone behind. She was now a fugitive. Even her dreams of a life with Gibbs. Though the contact in- through the contact information Pearl gave to Covey, she would find herself on a boat to London as the nanny of a family who knew someone, who knew someone, who knew someone else. Who knew Pearl? Yeah, so she's going to London where Gibbs is, but she can't even contact him Mm -hmm. because word would get back to little man's family and they could still hurt the people she Mm loved. Not her daddy so much. I mean, she loved him, but he's really in bad sorts right now. But Pearl, the housekeeper slash friend slash mother figure in her life and Bonnie, her best friend. So she was using her mother's surname um, and she was with this family of means. And she promised to work for them for a year. 
um, and they don't know our situation, just only that they're helping somebody to gain better opportunities. Mm -hmm. The woman who helped her reminded Covey that she needed to stay hidden because everything she was doing was illegal. And anybody connected her that found her would suffer the consequences. So she was receiving continued enforcement that she needed to leave her past behind her. Mm -hmm. Lion King. And move <laughs> as a different person. <laughs> Don't just drop that and move. Lion King. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Run Simba and never return. Mm -hmm. Y'all get it. She needed to present herself as a different person. Keep out of the way of other islanders. And she needed to remain invisible. This is a lonely position lonely oh yeah. yeah Covey it's already lonely being an immigrant uh, in a country where you don't know anyone you have no connections and the culture is just so different from what you're used to but then you can't even you have to be careful about making friends if you do find someone that shares your culture you gotta think are they from my home because I can't really talk to you because then it's gonna get back to little man family right oh it's just sad right. so when she eventually leaves the employer, the family, she begins school as a nursing student. So let's briefly return to the present, 2018. And I, the family is listening to the recording. And um, during the recording, Eleanor Bennett, their mom, reveals that she is Covetina Lynn Cook. Girl, we knew, but yes, oh. shocking. Because the kid, V and V are like, who is this Covey and why is Mama? T they not quick. These people are brilliant, but they not quick. <laughs> Listen. So when she said, I am Covey and Covey is me, they was like, dun, dun, what? Dun. Exactly. And the reader, we like, yeah, girl, duh. Duh, duh, duh. Anyway. <laughs> so B and B both wonder how their mother could hold such a story and they not know. They wondered if their mother was a murderer. She didn't say she didn't murder the man. Yeah. That's, yeah. Who did that? And they're like, I don't want to think of my mom that way. Yeah. So she picks <laughs> up and she, Mrs. Bennett picks back up in the story and tells B&B &B that although she told them she grew up in an orphanage, it was really somebody else's story. Mm -hmm. Another story. So the story she's been telling about her life to her children for her entire life is really uh, not her story. This is the first time they've known their mother's past. But the story she's been telling them, I was an orphan, I grew up in an orphanage. That's a story of someone else's life that Covey slash Eleanor knew once upon a time, which Alexis is telling us that time. Now, let's talk about <laughs> Eleanor Douglas, Ellie. Mm -hmm. Ellie and Covey became fast friends while they were both in nursing school. Nervous to befriend people, especially them from nervous to befriend people, especially those from the island. Ellie was a suitable friend. She was from the island, the other side of the island, but they was just meant to be friends. They, they had to be. <laughs> they connected. Right yeah. Now. Ellie had the goal of becoming a geologist, but because she was black, there was limitations put upon her in England and they were seeing England as a a place of kind of opportunity right Kari yeah before they of course because they had never been there before so when they arrived they thought all of my dreams will come true all I have to do is work hard and achieve them yeah that wasn't true so <laughs> she told Covey people still believe that to this day to this day <laughs> yeah right mm -hmm. yeah just like America. Yeah, so, yeah, of course. This is the dream. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the limitations were there. Ellie felt how limiting they were. And she was like, we got to get out of here. We got to escape. We got to accomplish our goals. And the way to do that is Canada. So let's make a plan. <laughs> Imagine Canada being a dream. I love Canada, by the way. I'm just saying, like. <laughs> it's the dream. This is how dire the straits are mm -hmm. that they're in. Straits Okay, it's dire. a hard situation. They trying to run to Canada for freedom, as many have done. Yeah. So she also mm -hmm. told Covey that she knew she didn't sleep at night. So she might as well come along with her. So it's the summer of yeah, 1967. She's, Go ahead. She's like, I know you're stressed. I know you're not. 
You're not sleeping at night because you're stressed out here. So come on, start a new life with me. We'll be sisters. So in the summer of 1967, they board a train to Edinburgh. And that train plows into a derailed freight car and losses of life occur. Fugitive. While in the hospital. (laughs) The nurses keep referring to Covey as Eleanor. And though she tried to correct them, they would only say, Covey has died. Covey has died. When they asked if she had family that she could contact, that they could contact, quick. Covey quickly realizes that adopting Ellie's identity was the best way to go. Because then for sure, she'd be like, dead, dead. Nobody would be looking Mm -hmm. for her. And she didn't want to be found out. So she assumed, of course, she assumed that they're still looking for her. And so for the second time in two years, she was dead. And she now has assumed the identity of Eleanor Douglas. Yeah. So when news reports come out, um, they say Covetina Brown died and she was identified through documents found at the scene. And when Covey arrived in Edinburgh for the new job, no one questioned it, of course, because they hadn't seen her. Um, She was good at her job, even though she didn't respond whenever they called her, but she could stop looking (laughs) over her shoulder. They'd be like, Eleanor, Eleanor. Eleanor, and she'd be looking around like, oh, oh, yes, yes, mm-hmm. that's me. Yeah. <laughs> so meanwhile. She's like, she, she, she good, but she a little strange. It's strange, right? Mm-hmm. She'd been through a lot. We ain't gonna say right. that. Meanwhile, her father was miserable from the path his life, of course, has taken. And he was wa- swallowed up with grief. And he attempts to take his life. But he fails at that. And some young boys some young boys save him and then Pearl tells him that they've got somebody accountable for little man's death and they're no longer looking for Covey as a sub a suspect and although yeah. this man denied having anything to do with it um they felt he, there was enough um motive for him to have done it this, they want to wrap up the case and everybody got motive. Yeah. <laughs> the story around the island is now that family. Covey just really took an advantage of an opportunity and it was highly unlikely that she killed little man. So Pearl makes an attempt to contact Covey through her contacts and she finally receives word back that Covey died in a train accident. Yeah. Of course, now everybody has officially learned that Covey is dead and everybody's saddened. Gibbs learns she's so close to him. And she's dead. Only to be taken away mm-hmm. in death. Yeah. He's devastated. My Covey was here yeah. the whole time. So at the new job, Covey soared, but would eventually be assaulted by her employer. Mm-hmm. And cautiously, she returns to England. The assault leads to a pregnancy. But when Covey returned to England, she ended up staying in this hospital hostel for unwed mothers. Um, and it's run by nuns. And these nuns would force her to give up her baby girl. So Covey worked and worked to try and get rid, uh, get her daughter back, but to no avail. They wouldn't tell her where the daughter is, uh, where she was placed. And they threatened to call the police and have her... Um, called mentally unstable this is heartbreaking i um yes she was assaulted and that assault produced a pregnancy but when she had that baby she wanted that baby 500 mm-hmm. percent, and they tricked her and quickly stole her child mm-hmm. um gave it to a local family for adoption and told her if you look for this child we're going to call the police. That's so dark. And she's been through so much already. And this is based on true events. Mm-hmm. This happened to people. A lot of people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's so sad. Yeah. So gross. And of course, she would. Covey's mom would learn later that a lot of people 
this was done to a lot of people. So one day she comes across a woman out, not directly, but she sees her in a distance. And she's like, if they see me, they'll know I'm not Ellie. They'll know I'm Covey. She I saw someone stay. from home. From school. Yeah. She saw someone from school. Oh, it's from mm-hmm. school. Okay. And she's okay. like, I can't stay here. I've got to go. And where does she mm-hmm. go? The U.S. But she knows she has to leave behind her baby and she has to leave Gibbs behind. But before she leaves, she finally sees her childhood, well, her teenage love. And what would she do? She tries to call out to him, but she doesn't have the voice. But Gibbs sees her and he's like, Hmm, that looked like my covey. But I usually Yeah, he's see like, her. my eyes are playing tricks on me because mm-hmm. I know my covey dad. Yeah. But he could tell that this woman is trying to say something to him. Yes, sure enough, it's covey. <laughs> Yes. They back together, y'all. So they make a plan to leave together. Together. Mm -hmm. And they go to the U.S. So they go. They're now back together. Gibbs decides he wants to change his. He's going to change his name. He's also helping to protect Covey. Um, Covey never told him about the assault or the baby. And a year before Covey's death, do a quick fast forward. A year before Covey's death. Okay, stop. Okay, Covey never tells Gibbs about the assault or the baby, but they live happily ever after. We know they have B&B. And a year before Covey's death, she starts to look for her child that was given up for adoption. She was always looking for her, but the search intensifies. Mm -hmm. And with the help of her attorney, she finds her daughter. Like, get down to the nitty gritty, because remember, she ends up making that phone call to her. So what I remember is that um, Covey, now Eleanor, is really distraught. She's had a lot of pain in her life. Her husband died. Years go by and she just can't shake the sadness because no one knows everything she's been through, but he came close. Um, They did have a beautiful life together and she decides one day I'm going to take my life in a way that um, doing something that I love. And so she takes a surfboard and heads to some um, turbulent waters She's rescued, however, and while in the hospital, she haphazardly, I thought, sees a woman talking about food. And that woman has her voice, but that woman is white. And she's like, this is my daughter. I, I know this is my daughter. Mm-hmm. And that's how I thought she found her. Well, right. She sees her on TV, but she doesn't know how to get in touch with her. And that is where the attorney comes in. He helps her oh, make okay, that okay. link. That's the. And then she just starts crank calling her. <laughs> <laughs> she don't go, hey, girl, I'm your mama. Because that's a lot. Mm-hmm. So she just calls and like be breathing. <laughs> <laughs> and the woman be like, hello? Hello? Right. <laughs> Pronto. Because she Cause Italian. She's Italian. Pronto. Yeah, yeah. So that mm-hmm. happened, y'all. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to wrap it up. Okay, I'll wrap it up by telling you that the three children of Coventina Lynn Cook, um, what's her last name? Bennett. (laughs) That's her made up name. Um, Come together and they have their mother's black cake. And through their mother's attorney, Mr. Mitch, um, they're able to make other connections that Covey wanted them to make. They connect with her best friend, Bunny, and they connect even with Covey's father. And so that's a a lot. So that's just the focus of Covey's story, Eleanor Bennett's story. There's lots more in this story. Lots more. 
even while they're eating the cake, there's a surprise yeah, inside. Lots. There's so much <laughs> in this story. And when they meet the dad, there's also some drama there. Also, this book is a good reminder that the man will be fine. <laughs> Apply that to any situation. The man will be fine. Lost his wife. His daughter died in the sea. The man will be fine. Eventually, Lynn gets over his gambling like it's a cold. <laughs> I ain't a gambler no more. He marries a new woman, has a lot of kids, and he's wealthy. Yeah. And he's like, oh, my daughter family. And the son tells him, like, look at us. One of us is white. Guess how that happened? And that's all because of you. And spoiler, because this is filled with spoilers. Lynn has a stroke, but he don't die because the man will be fine. (laughs) Well, that's the end of our story. (laughs) Okay. Shall we take a quick break? (laughs) Yeah, let's do it. And we're back. So sorry. Yes. What's your final verdict? And would you recommend this book? Listen, this is the type of book that's so hard to condense into a 40 minute recap. You did an excellent job. And even with spoilers, you haven't given the book away. It's amazing because there are so many layers to this book. And reader, whether you read the book along with us or you listen to our show before reading the book, I know that outside of this podcast, you're going to draw your own conclusions from your reading. It will be a new book to you, um, even if you've heard this episode. And that's so beautiful. So my final verdict is, of course, I would recommend this book. (laughs) It's beautiful. It's great. Has she written any other novels that I can read? I know. As far as I I know this is the only one to do. Wow, Charmaine, what a choice. Um, just excellent. You're an amazing writer. I fell in love with each individual character. And even though that um, the daughter was getting on my nerves at the beginning of the story, I eventually came around to her side. And I was like, girl, I see. I see why you do what you do. I mean, everyone has a reason. The only person, even Lynn, even the father, you're like, you feel heartbreak for him. He's doing these terrible things. Um, but your heart breaks for him too. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Just my. Mm. Once you hear his backstory, it adds context. That's all. I won't say your heart break for him. Uh, you ain't got nothing but for little man. No, he on his own. Um, but anyway, well done. Five stars. I definitely recommend this book. I can't wait to read it again slowly, taking my time. And uh, I really cannot wait to read this book again. And I can't wait to make some black cake. What did you think, Alexis? Great pick, uh, in my opinion. What did you think, though, of the book you chose? So, you know how I say the back and forth is really hard. I thought this back and forth was a little easier. Oh, I think we do like back and forth. Sometimes so what she's talking about is last, Sometimes we last don't. week we soar. Last week we saw we hate that. We hate when they go back in the past, then the future, then the present, then the in-between. Just ke- stay on one linear track. Um, we was just kidding. We love that. <laughs> but you got to do it right. <laughs> you can't be girl on the train in us, so we don't even care where we are in time. <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> when did that? Oh, okay. So what? So I think it helps, too, when all these different time periods have a different set of characters. Mm -hmm. When you're using the same character and taking me all through, um, you know, uh, quantum leaps, (laughs) I got time for it. Exactly. It's harder to track. Yeah. So I like how the the black cake was weaved through here. And I like how they felt about the black cake, the story behind the black cake. And we learn a little history about it. Um, I like the story of Covey, Coventina Cook, Lynn Cook. Um, I enjoyed this book and I would definitely read it again, again, slowly. Um, I listened to it a couple of times, but I need to read it. You know, having your eyes see the words makes a big Mm -hmm. difference in how you understand things. So I really enjoyed it. I agree. Would definitely recommend it. And I forgot to add, remember I was mentioning the restaurant? So I came in the restaurant, I had my book, and 
the owner says to me, it was just a group of women in here with that book. So I think wow. they're book clubbing it at the Jamaican restaurant and having black cake. So cool. Absolutely <sighs> love it. I love any reason to support a local restaurant, a uh, small owned mm-hmm. mom and pop shop or whatever. Um, but this is a really beautiful reason. That sounds so Isn't cute. It, right? Oh, I love it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, well, anyway, this book brought out all the feels. Great pick, Alexis. Thank you again. What are we reading next week? A Flicker in the Dark by Stacey Willingham. Yeah, so this is my pick. I owe Alexis and the listeners an apology because apparently I'm in a morbid state. <laughs> and I keep picking these sad books where children must be no- be unlived. <laughs> okay? Unlived, unlived. Uh, however, mm-hmm. I chose it. I take full responsibility, as Gibbs did. And um, that'll be our book next week. Thank you, listeners, for listening to Lit Society. We'll see you next Thursday or Wednesday on YouTube. I'm going to try to post more on Wednesday. I know I've been delaying with the YouTube. It takes a lot of time. So with our video episodes the last two weeks, uh, one week I completely skipped. And then the other week I posted it on a Thursday. I'm going to try to publish next week on Wednesday on YouTube exclusively. And then our podcast audio version will be available Thursday as usual. Well, Lit Society we is, appreciate yeah. all you do. <laughs> okay, thanks. Lit Society is brought to you by Alexis Sanaria and Kari Herrera. Support the cause by leaving a five-star review for our show on Apple Podcasts, along with a comment about why you absolutely love us. We love you, too. If you've enjoyed what you've just heard, tell a friend about Lit Society. Visit LitSocietyPod.com for show notes, this month's book list, and to sign up for our amazing email newsletter, which will start again soon. <laughs> uh, that's also on me. Um, and you guys, you can leave comments about each episode on Spotify now, and you've been doing so. <laughs> like, I, I, I was shocked. To find, I said, <laughs> I didn't even know you could do that. <laughs> Spotify sent me emails like people are responding to your show and I was like they is oh (laughs) so beautiful thank Thank you. you so yeah if you love this episode please leave a comment on Spotify if you hate it or hate us leave a comment too I just won't publish it <laughs> alright then well until next time read, read something, read something.